Good evening, church. Good to see everyone out this evening. Let's grab our hymn books and turn to 570. 570 will sing, Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. 570, standing together and singing it out. Faith is the victory. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the bow and fails below. All our strength be hurled, faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love. His banner over us is love. Our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on of every field. The faith by which they conquered death still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find, drawn up in dread array, the tents of ease be left behind, and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, with truth all heard about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread, and echo with a shout. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world on the last to him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then upward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. Sounds like you might believe it. Amen. Amen. Faith is the victory. It's all about who our faith is in, Jesus Christ. Let's go to him in prayer for this evening service. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, this time where we're able to spend together as one body. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, just bless our time together as we hear from your word, from your messenger. And Lord, as we continue to sing songs of praise unto you. And Lord, the time that is set aside for 
communing with you in prayer. Lord, I pray that you would bless all of it. Lord, that you would uh, just be high and lifted up in this service this evening. And Father, we thank you for the truths that we just sang about, that, Lord, we do have victory. And Lord, we know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Father, I pray that you would help us to live victorious and joyful lives, even in this world where there's much turmoil and distraction and chaos. But Father, we know that you have given us uh, the spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. I pray, Father, that you would help us to live that way. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's continue standing and turn over to 536. 536, we'll sing, My Life, Lord, is Yours to Control. 536. I humbly seek you. Now use my life, O oh Lord, I pray. I yield my stubborn will completely. May your commandments light my way. My life, Lord, is yours to control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will, never mind, rich treasures to find. Give wisdom to choices I make, along every path that I take. So when I complete life's race, well done, you will say. Promise me the victory, and all I need to do is claim your strength to soar with wings as eagles, to walk, to run, and not to faint. My life, Lord, is yours to control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will, never mind, rich treasures to find. Give wisdom to choices I make, along every path that I take. So when I complete life's race, well done, you will say. Good evening, everyone, and I'm so thankful for faithful church folks that want to come out on a Wednesday night, amen, amen, to not only seek the fellowship of God's people, but also seek the presence of our God himself in prayer, and I uh, want to welcome those joining us on the live stream. Thank you also for following and tuning in, and we have a very special service tonight. We have a couple of guests with us. Um, first, I want to just welcome a first-time visitor, Brother Keith Bigger, uh, from here in Cambria Heights is visiting with us. I had a good conversation with him on the phone and shares a passion for good Bible preaching and for revival. And so he is visiting with us tonight. Thanks for being here. Hope you get a chance to introduce him. And then uh, we, I want to introduce uh, Pastor Jim Scudder, pastor of, is it Quinton Road Baptist Church in Illinois near Chicago? And also I have a very special guest behind me that some of you are waiting for me to introduce. Dave Carnes, of course, no stranger to us. <laughs> He's got to greet some folks here. But uh, so Pastor, Pastor Scudder is helping Brother Dave film a documentary this week. Uh, as many of us know, this September will mark 20 years uh, since the 9-11 attacks. And many of us remember Brother Dave's testimony, how God used him to rescue two Port Authority officers that day. And so they're recording uh, throughout the city and also in Connecticut and recording here in our church, too. Uh, some things for this documentary and and so they'll share about that and pray please pray for this that the project goes successfully and everything's done smoothly and obviously the gospel is given clearly it could be a powerful thing especially for our first responders our police officers our firemen those that that really need the gospel the most and so please pray for this endeavor 
Uh, evangelist Chris Miller is also going to be in town this week helping with that. And so please pray for that. So we're making tonight um, Dave Carnes night. And so he's going to, he was originally supposed to be here Sunday, but some schedule conflicts changed that. So he's going to be sharing his testimony for us tonight. And so I'm going to take a break tonight and we get to be stirred by our brother. And uh, he gets to kind of keep us posted on what he's been up to lately. Uh, just one more quick announcement before I turn things over to Brother Dave. Uh, of course, this weekend is our family conference, so please be in prayer for that. Friday night, we kick things off with our young adults right here, 7 o'clock. All young adults, college and career are invited. And then Saturday at 6 p.m. is the married couples banquet. Please register online if you haven't done so yet. If you need help, let us know. And then all day Sunday, evangelist Dan Knickerbocker will be preaching for us. And so we're praying. We'll, we'll, men we'll mention that later during our prayer time as well. Okay, without further ado, Brother Dave Carnes. Take it away, brother. Right. Thank you, Pastor Lubin. Well, it's good to be back in Bible Baptist Church. Before I start preaching, I, I want to say a quick prayer to God. Father, thank you for bringing uh, myself and the film crew here safely today. Thank you for the things we were able to accomplish. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd bless this project, uh, that this testimony and video might go forth and, and touch many hearts, Lord, and, say, and souls might be saved, Lord, through the testimony that you, you gave me as you used me on 9-11, Lord. And Lord, may you touch hearts here tonight. If anyone here is not saved, Lord, we pray that today, now would be the time that they would give their life to Christ and get saved, Lord. And Lord, that we would leave this service tonight with an urgency to send out the gospel, Lord, to boldly profess salvation to the lost, Lord. Because we never know when the, the end is going to be. I'm going to talk about 9-11, Lord, and thousands of people died that day thinking they had a, a long life ahead of them but it was cut short in an instant. And Lord, give us that boldness, that urgency to, to reach the, the loss for Christ. In his name we pray. Well, uh, you know, I could talk for hours on what God did, you know, on 9-11, the way he used me throughout the day. And to this day, it's almost 20 years later, I, I stand in awe that God chose Dave Carnes to, to do what he had me to do on 9-11. Uh, I'm reading Mike Lindell's book right now, What Are the Odds? I, I read another chapter on the flight here, and you know he talks about all the, the miracles that God had performed in his life. And, saved him <clears throat> from uh, the bad decisions that he made throughout his life. Actually saved his life over and over. And that's me. <laughs> it hit me. That's me. Uh, throughout my life, I, I made a lot of stupid decisions, and God, God had mercy on me and saved me. And what I did on 9-11 was... Uh, Totally God led. I, I, I don't. I can't take any credit for it. Put that on. Oh, okay. I thought I talked pretty loud, but yeah, all right. That feels that feels weird. All right. Okay. I was born and raised in, in a suburb of Pittsburgh in a steel town called Monhall, which is right next to Homestead. <clears throat> Homestead was the birthplace of steel in this country. Uh, my grandfather retired from U.S. Steel Homestead Works after 34 years in charge of an entire division of maintenance 
the slab and plate, 100 inch mill. Then my dad, both of him and my dad started out pushing a broom and labor, labor gang, which I later did. But they worked their ways up. My dad retired as divisional general foreman in charge of maintenance for the structural division, which is the steel mill, the plant that I went to work in back in like 1980, 79. Uh, and I started pushing a broom and a labor gang. <clears throat> my dad retired, I think I said, after 32 years himself. So there was always this loyalty to, to employers, you know, in my family. And, you know, if you got a job in a steel mill, you were basically a shoe in for life. You had job security because nobody ever thought the steel mills were ever going to shut down. And uh, I went to work there, and after about five and a half years, they laid me off. It was 1983. There's big layoffs in the steel mills uh, and, uh, at U.S. Steel. And uh, my unemployment ran out, and I, I took an ad, responded to an ad for a police officer in the borough near my house. <clears throat> Whitaker Borough, and so I showed up, and uh, I'm leaving out a lot of stuff for time's sakes, but I got hired, myself and another guy. Uh, if they'd known our backgrounds, they would never would have hired us. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was in the active reserves at the time in the Marine Corps, I guess maybe 12 years I had in. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had worked in a steel mill. I think the Marine Corps background helped me. And I guess I get a, gave a good talk with a pretty interview. And my friend, uh, he got hired too. <clears throat> he uh, had an army background. He was a ranger. He used to walk point in Vietnam. So it's a lot of bad action over there. But he was the president of the Barbarian Motorcycle Gang. And I was one of his good buddies. In fact, I was at his house at a, for a party the night before. Neither one of us knew that we were going to go interview for a police job the next day. <clears throat> when I showed up for the interview, I sat, and I was next one in line. The door opened up, and he comes walking out. The night before, he had a red beard down here. We called him Red Beard. And he had long hair. And I see this clean-cut guy, but I recognize the eyes. And I, I said, Red Beard, is that you? Shh. Yeah, Carnsey, good luck. When it's up the next day, we both got a phone call to show up at the mayor's house. I showed up, and the mayor said, come around back to the kitchen. <clears throat> I walk around back, and I open the door, and who's sitting at the mayor's kitchen table but Redbeard having milk and cookies with the mayor? <clears throat> and uh, we both uh, became police officers, and, you know, he went on to, you know, retire from law enforcement. I gave it f five years uh, and I love law enforcement. I, that was the best job I ever had. I love being a cop. You know, you get to, to help people. You never know what the next call is going to be. Uh, it's the adrenaline rush, which I, you know, Marines kind of like, I guess. Uh, but in 86, uh, I went to Allegheny County Police Academy, graduated uh, top of my class, and I went on to Florida for a sheriff's job, deputy sheriff in Pinellas County. I was just on there for a short period, and I didn't know when I hired on down there that they were under federal investigation, and I show up, they thought I was a, a federal plant, and they gave me a hard time, let, never let me out of field training. And uh, then they confronted me, we know you're an FBI plant, and you know, why don't you admit it? And I remember like, I thought it was some kind of a test that they're testing me, my loyalty or whatever, and it was a play in the game. You know, deputy doesn't know what you're talking about, sir. <clears throat> And the next day I show up and they, they ask me for my gun and my badge. And I, <laughs> I thought as I was walking across the parking lot, they were going to call me back in and, ah, you passed the test, Dave. You know, come on, you know, good job. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, I'm reading the paper and the indictments fell and, and the, the chief blew his head off, committed suicide, and a lot of people were, went to jail for corruption. It was in the, that department. But God saved me from that. Uh, and I went back in the Marine Corps on active duty. And uh, when I, uh, I asked to join a deploying unit, and uh, right away I deployed with the 6th Fleet to the Med, and when we did our transplant, I stopped at Rota, Spain, and there I, I met a, a young girl on a tour to Sevilla and I ended up marrying her. <laughs> uh, it's my wife, Rosemary. <clears throat> and, you know, so I had to, God took me to Rota, Spain to meet a girl from New York City to be my wife. Think about that. 
uh, and I, that was in 1988. I met her, married her in 1990. If you add up the time we actually spent together, it was maybe two weeks physically because we, we wrote letters a lot. Uh, think of that. Now they, I guess you'd be texting each other. But uh, <coughs> in 1992, I'm getting out of the Marine Corps. I'm telling you this background because it all leads up as to well, how God used me for 9-11. Uh, in 1992, uh, my EAS, end of enlistment, is, is up. And I wanted to re-enlist, but my wife, she was, she was still back in New York City because she was a fashion designer down in Madison Avenue. <coughs> and... Uh, I guess we decided, like, you know, I'd always be away deployed because that's the kind of Marine I was. So I got out and wanted to drive to live in Pittsburgh. <clears throat> I remember flying over towards Pittsburgh Airport. Rosemary saw the, the point, the downtown Pittsburgh, and she looked out the window. Oh, what a cute little city. <clears throat> I thought it was huge, but, you know, compared to Manhattan, I guess to her it was a cute little city. <laughs> and anyway, she... After her visit, she said, no way I would live, move to this hick town. <laughs> uh, that's, I guess, the girl that grows up in Manhattan thinks of anywhere outside of Manhattan. Uh, so, you know, to make the wife happy, I, I relocated to New York City. Never had, had even been here before I met her. And uh, ended up uh, getting a job, you know, after I got my accounting degree at, at St. John's down the road here. Uh, I got hired by Deloitte, <clears throat> one of the big six at the time. Now they're the big four, and the biggest of the big four. Uh, I had got the accounting degree to go to the FBI, but God slammed that door shut after I had passed the test and I'm ready for my final board. He slammed that door shut because I turned 37 and that was the age cap to get in. So I had no other choice. I figured I got this accounting degree. Let me you know, send a cover letter and a resume to two of the big six, and I, I did, and I, I got offers by both of them, Arthur Anderson and Deloitte. Arthur Anderson, if anybody, they, they went belly up a few years back, uh, actually right before 9-11. <clears throat> and uh, so I chose right there. But that put me at the World Financial Center as my workplace. I used to take the train uh, from Valley Stream, where I lived, right down the road. I'd go to Long Island Railroad, take it into Manhattan. Uh, I guess it was... Uh, Penn Station, take the e, the e or the A down to the World Trade Center and walk up through the North Tower across the skywalk that connected to, to World Financial Center. So for five and a half years, that was my workplace. A couple months before 9-11, <clears throat> God had, I guess, arranged for me to, uh, to switch job locations. I got sent up to Wilton, Connecticut which was Deloitte's national headquarters for a two-week assignment. On that two-week assignment, uh, I guess they liked my work and they, they offered me a position in some management development program, which is a very prestigious thing. It puts you on track to learn a national office function and the expectation is you become a partner and go back to your practice office and you're the resident expert and whatever, whatever you were taught up at national office. <clears throat> so I turned it down three times in a row and I mentioned to my wife that uh, I, this guy kept bugging me to join this program, and I told her about it. And she said, are you crazy? <laughs> tell him yes. I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to tell him yes, honey, after I told him no three times. <clears throat> I said, but I'll tell you what, if he asks me a fourth time, I'll, I'll say yes. <clears throat> but I'm thinking, like, there's no way this guy's going to ask me a fourth time after I told him no three times. I go into work that day, and guess what? <clears throat> Dave, I really wish you'd consider joining the management development program. I said, I said you know what? My wife said... If you were to ask me again, I had to say yes. So, okay, uh, yes. And that's how I ended up there, reluctantly. Whereas anybody else like, would write like, a, a thesis of you know, war and peace about their life and what, they, what a benefit they'd be for Deloitte if they got the job or that opportunity, and I took it reluctantly. <clears throat> and actually prayed to God, should I do this? Because it was going to relocate me from Valley Stream all the way up to Connecticut for two years. So I took it, <clears throat> and... That was like just a few weeks before 9-11 happened. So I'm up there now, and I got this fancy office, you know, very surreal, pristine place. We, we saw it today. There's wild turkeys walking around, ducks, deer, you know, frolicking across the meadows. Uh, and my phone rang. 
around 8.20 or so in the morning. It was my sister in Pittsburgh. She was on her exercise bike, and she said, Dave, I'm, I was watching CNN. Uh, uh, the North Tower, or the World Trade Center is on fire. <clears throat> I says, what do you mean on fire? I says, what, are, what do you see? And she says, the whole top half of the building, you can't even see it. It's engulfed in thick black smoke. They're saying a small plane accidentally flew into it. I said, uh, I looked outside. It was a, a clear, sunny day outside, like kind of like today was. And I said, Joy, there's no way, because, you know, Connecticut's only like 50 miles as a crow flies to Manhattan. <clears throat> I said, no way there's a small plane flew into that building accidentally, and it would, it would just, like, bounce off of it and not do any damage if it did. I said, she said, what could it be? I said, it had to be a hijacked commercial airliner. And she said, who would do that? And I said, well, Arab terrorists. Because that week we were supposed to sentence that blind sheikh that tried to blow up and knock down the North Tower back in 93. And they warned us that if we did that, that they would bring the towers down. And I remember listening a few weeks before to talk radio. I think it was WABC or WOR, the two AM talk radio stations. And somebody had called in and said that the, that threat was made and that they threatened to fly hijacked commercial airliners into the towers. So that I heard that on, on talk radio. So, you know, if I heard it, like, I think our government probably heard it too, somewhere, uh, I would hope. <laughs> but it happened. I guess nobody thought that that kind of evil would ever be perpetrated on, on a nation, but it, it happened to us that day. And anyway, I hung up with her, and I called my colleagues together, and I, I said, hey, you know, like the World Trade Center is on fire. I think a commercial airliner was hijacked and flew, flown into it. And we talked about it, and I went back to the office, and, and the phone rang as soon as I walked in there. And it was my sister again. She said, Dave, you were right. I just watched it on television. A commercial airliner just flew into the South Tower. They're both on fire now. It's, hor it's horrible. <clears throat> and I, I gathered my colleagues together again. I told them, like, as of right now, our country is at war. And I said, uh, I'm going to leave here and go down to the World Trade Center. Then I'm going to join the Marine Corps. You probably won't see me again. <laughs> I said that right then and there, which they probably thought I was crazy. But that's the way Marines think. But I went to my office and I closed the door and I, uh, I went to God in earnest prayer for probably a couple hours. And I, I, I prayed to God and I tried to envision, like put myself in the shoes of the people in that building. I tried to do that when I was a cop, put my, myself in the shoes of the, the people I was serving or the bad guys, you know, how they think, what are they thinking? And I put myself in those buildings and I started thinking about what those people were going through that were north, higher up, the higher floors of those planes where they hit. And all that jet fuel and what it would do. And the thing that came to my mind was a, an oven. Like when you're baking a turkey and you open that oven door and that blast of hot air hits you in the face. And it's only like, what, 350, 400 degrees? And if you touch any metal, it, it just burns you. You get a bad burn. And... I'm thinking that's what it's like in the towers right now. And I was like, uh, it ripped my heart out of my chest. I'm thinking like, wow, there's thousands of people in there. You know, little girls, uh, women and children, uh, men, you know, those people are going to work like any other day thinking they've got like their whole life ahead of them. You know, they're, they're working at the World Trade Center. They got it made, you know. I used to have clients in there. I knew that building. I knew how crowded it usually was. And uh, I said to God, I said, God, if it means my life today, use me any way you have. And if there's anybody that needs help, and mind you, the, the towers were still standing then. Uh, or it's, I go down as a Marine, you know. So I, I left after I was done praying. And I went up to the roof of the building, and I, I jumped into a car that I had just bought two months before, <clears throat> which uh, I didn't need. I was 65 grand in debt. I should have never bought. The bank should have never approved the loan. <clears throat> Pastor Barker, I told him, I said, I'm showing my wife cars today, and I, I think God wants me to buy a car. I, don't, I can't explain it, Pastor. I didn't tell him what it was. He said, well, Brother Dave, you know God works in mysterious ways. Pray about it, and God will give you the answer. So for three days, I prayed. <clears throat> God, do you, do you really, really think it's a good idea? I think it's irresponsible for me to buy this car. I'm 65 grand a day. 
and uh, there was no, uh, no doubt in my mind that God wanted me to have it. And I called the bank, and like idiots, they gave me the loan. And I pulled up, I'll never forget the day, I rolled up in front of church, the service, evening service just lit out. And I'm in this black Porsche with the top off, and Pastor Barker says, Brother Dave. I said, yeah, Pastor, this is, the, this is the car I told you about that God wanted me to buy. He says, but it's a Porsche. <laughs> and he said, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> And, well, the morning of 9-11, when I went to the roof of that building, my 85 Mercury was down at the street at Richie's Body Shop down the road, getting the rust holes in the trunk repaired, because they rusted through, and the car was like five different colors. You know, it was powder blue hood, red front fender, the car was gray, and a bleached out roof. And uh, I don't think I, it, I would have made it down to New York. Uh, I needed that Porsche. The Porsche legitimized me. It was a pretty car, flashy, and it was fast. And it, had, it was a convertible. So when I left here, well, I left Wilton, and I, I went and got a haircut. We actually found the barber shop. God led us to it, because I thought it was going to be like a needle in a haystack. In Stanford, I showed up to get a haircut, because I knew he was going to go as a Marine. So I got a haircut just like this. And then I, I, got, I went to my house where I was staying. I rented a room for 400 bucks, shared it with three other guys. and. And I jumped in my starch Marine Corps camouflage utilities, which I always kept at the ready in my closet, just in case our shores ever got attacked, which is a kind of a crazy thing to do, but it's something, a quirky thing I did, thinking I, I hoped I never would have to take that off the hangar, but I did on 9-11. And I put that uniform on, <coughs> and I hightailed it down to here. And going down New England freeway, I'm seeing all these signs, all roads to New York closed. Uh, and everybody's telling me, I told my wife what I was going to do. She said, are you crazy? You're not going to get anywhere near Manhattan. All the roads are closed. And, you know, even if you get down there, you know, you're just going to be in a way because all the professionals, they got it covered. They're going to be all over that place. And <clears throat> but when I left my office, God put a picture on my heart what I was going to find when I got down there. And it was, I was going to walk into total devastation and I, I would be the only one there. And I kept that in my mind, you know, like, and I, so I drove, I'm driving down New England Free, I see those signs, all roads closed, and then I have this little boom box on the seat next to me blasting, because the radio didn't work in the car. It was a 79. And uh, I hear them saying that the, the Throgs Neck and the Whitestone Bridges are closed because there were bomb threats that they, you couldn't get across. You know, New England Freeway shut down. <clears throat> so I, I'm almost there. And I said, I said, God, I said, you know, help me. Let me get across the bridge. I got to get to Long Island and get my, my Marine Corps gear. So I roll up, and I thought there would be like a mile long of cars because they can't get across, and you know, they, they all be stopped. The access would be blocked. There was no cars around anywhere. I rolled up, and the, the lady at the booth looked scared to death. She says, <clears throat> I, I was getting the five bucks out or whatever it was at the time to pay her, and she said, just, just go. And I'm crossing the bridge. I looked over. You could see the skyline in New York City very clearly from the Throgs Neck or the Whitestone. And the towers, the Twin Towers were the most prominent of the, they dwarfed everything else and they were gone. It was just two columns of black smoke. And that's when I realized that they had fallen. <clears throat> so I drove down here to Valley Stream and I had my gear in this old lady's garage, uh, two doors from my house. I, I got my gear out, and filled my canteens up with water and check my first aid kit, mapping everything out like a Marine would do before he goes into combat. And uh, then I, uh, I jumped in the car and I drove here. And I, I stopped at uh, Bible Baptist Church because I wanted to pray in, in just in case. And God put Pastor Barker right out in front of the church on the sidewalk as I rolled up. And he said, Brother Dave, you're going down here, aren't you? And I said, yes, Pastor. And I knew you would. And uh, I was in my uniform, mind you. And uh, I got out of the car, and I said, Pastor, can we pr please pray? And we prayed right there in front of the church on, in, the, in the middle of that parking lot roadway there and uh, asked God to, to guide me and protect me and uh, jumped back in the car, and I, I drove down to, on the Belt Parkway. NYPD cops were blocking all the entranceways, but they, they saw me in that Porsche and a Marine, you know, looking like, you know, serious business. They let me onto the Belt Parkway, and I drove to 6th Com Battalion, Floyd Benefield is my old reserve unit. I had been out of the Marine Corps for a year and a half, but you know, I, I just figured maybe the Marines were deploying because it was just right down the road. 
<clears throat> and they weren't. They, they had an ISO container blocking the, the entryway, the gate, and they had a, a Marine out there with a field radio on his back. And, and uh, they were, I, I talked to the, the CO through the radio, and he said they were on alert. And I knew what that meant. I was a reservist before. That means they're staying at home waiting for the, the, the phone to ring. <clears throat> I said, sir, the last thing that the Washington, D.C., the Pentagon's thinking right now is 6th Bomb Battalion. You need to make the call yourself and deploy your Marines. Yeah, that's not the way it works, Staff Sergeant. So I said, can I at least draw an M16 with some rifle, some ammunition? <laughs> He's just laughing at me. He says, no. So I jumped back in my car and uh, tried to hitch a ride with the Coast Guard next door. The NYPD wouldn't let me in there. So I get on the highway, Belt Parkway. I'm, I'm going like really fast and uh, it occurs to me like that <clears throat> I look down at the speedometer, there's this little dial on the right on a Porsche. The, the tack is like this big thing in the middle and you, you gotta kinda look under the steering wheel to see how fast you're going, which I thought was dangerous because I knew I was going fast, but it, it appeared like I was going in excess of 135 mile an hour. And it occurred to me like I might die just trying to get there because I haven't driven this car. I was driving my Mercury. I didn't need this car, <clears throat> but God wanted me to buy it. And I, I only, I didn't even check the air pressure in the tires. I didn't know how old they were. I just added like a half a quart of oil to the engine and I parked it. And then because my car was getting worked on, I took it to work that morning. Now here I am, I'm, I'm going like very fast in it on Belt Parkway. And it occurred to me like, God had you buy this car, Dave. Don't worry about it, God's got it covered. And I, I didn't worry about it. I, I think I went even faster. I don't know how fast I was going, but I, I don't think I could have wrecked the car if I wanted to. It, it gripped the, the highway like a magnet. But it was just what I needed, because if I fast forward, you'll see why. <clears throat> so I, I, I go down, I get to the Brooklyn Bridge. First of all, I stopped off at McDonald's and I got a double quarter pounder with cheese and a, and a large Coke and a fries, because I knew that I, I hadn't, I realized I hadn't eaten all day. I was preparing for this, and I, I didn't want to, like, pass out once I got there because I was too hungry. And people laugh, and they, they laugh like you did, like, you stopped and got a burger? Yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm a human being. i got to feed the machine. <clears throat> and, uh, but it was weird when I stopped it. It was on, uh, what is that, uh, that exit by, in Brooklyn, uh, near Floyd Bennett Field. Anyway. When I went to that McDonald's, I'm walking out and there's these kids. You could see the World Trade Center smoke on the, because we were close, closer to Manhattan there. And they're, they're walking along like, you know, like, like it was a normal day, like any old day, like laughing and joking and stuff. And I'm thinking like, wow, you know, how can they have that spirit about them when that's going on right behind them? You know, that was weird, I thought, you know. But uh, I, anyway, I jumped in my car and I got back on the, I got to the Brooklyn Bridge. And, uh, you know, on the Brooklyn side, it was, it was beautiful. It was a clear, sunny day. And when I got across the other side of the bridge, it was like this big, dark, ugly cloud of, of smoke and debris. And I drove into that, and there was an NYPD officer at near one police plaza, city hall area. And he, he, car he ID'd me. That was the first time. I had gone through, like, three other entryways and never got ID'd until the Brooklyn Bridge. And, and I pulled out my expired pink reserve ID and showed it to him. And uh, he said, uh, he said, go get him staff sergeant, something like that. And uh, I was gonna drive that car that I just bought all the way to the World Trade Center because I figured I'm on a mission from God and you know, this is what this is all about. And I was gonna pull up right beside the burning towers. And, but uh, there was all kind of cops in the middle of the street. You know, it was very surreal and eerie. Uh, unbeknownst to me, Tower 7 had just collapsed like minutes before I got there. And all that papers and debris was raining from the sky onto me because I had the roof off the, the Porsche. And he says, no, you can't go. I said, I'm going to go right up to the Trade Center, officer. Said, no, no, you can't do that. Uh, you've got emergency of vehicles and equipment. You park it between the side of Pace University. So right between the Brooklyn Bridge and Pace University. There was a couple of picnic tables there, I guess, for the kids to have some break time. And, and uh, some other cars, I guess, first responder had jumped the curb and were parked next to these picnic tables. So I did that. I parked my Porsche there and, and uh, I got my gear out. I figured what I'm gonna take. I figured, well, you know, maybe I don't think I really need the flak jacket. That's like the bullet plates and stuff. And, and, uh, 
and I left the helmet behind, but I took my repelling gear, you know, that repel off of mountains and buildings and stuff, and I put on my canteens and my war belt and H harness, and f I had a field flashlight and, and all that stuff that I would wear into combat, and uh, buttoned up my car, and I put a little note on the wiper, because, you know, I knew, I knew how the parking authority was, even though it's like 9-11, they're probably gonna be stupid and put a ticket on my car or something because I was illegally parked, technically. And I, I put that on the windshield, like, first responder, please do not tow. And I walked away, and I looked back, and I, I said this selfish little prayer to God. I said, God, should I survive the day? <clears throat> Can I keep the Porsche? Uh, and, I, and I just forgot about that. And I, as I'm walking away, I'm there, that wasn't right, Dave. You shouldn't have prayed that. And I walked through all that stuff, that smoke and papers raining down. It was very eerie. Something I would never, ever in my life expected to see in Lower Manhattan. And, and when I got to the uh, JR Music World, Park Row South and Vesey Street, uh, there was uh, a group of about five military guys that, like me, had put on their field uniforms and responded. And I said, I introduced myself, that's on Carnes, you know, can you update me on what's, what's going on now. And they said, well, SSR and Tower 7 just collapsed. And I knew that, that where that was. It was like the third biggest tower. And everybody's pulled back. And, you know, I said, well, what, what were you guys doing? They said, well, we were just helping the firemen out in the fringe areas, you know, looking for people. <clears throat> and I said, okay. So I asked, it was like a couple Army guys, an Air Force guy and one Marine sergeant. I asked the Marine to take a walk with me. Uh, and uh, we walked towards Church and Vesey Street. That was the start of the plaza for the Trade Center. And, and uh, there was a group of about 20 firemen, FDNY guys, all standing around like a platoon-sized formation. And I went up to the biggest one, looked like he was in charge. I says, hey, uh, to your knowledge, has anybody been in the epicenter today doing search and rescue? He goes, no, Marine. If you go in there, you're going to die. And I'm really like, oh. I'm thinking, like, that's exactly what God had put on my heart up in Wilton. It would be the situation. It, it was total devastation, and no one was in there. Meanwhile, everybody throughout the day is thinking that there's going to be hundreds of people, professionals all over it. That's their job. It's not your job. You're just going to be in the way. But when I showed up, they actually, I heard one of them, like, saying, oh, thank God the Marines are here. You know, we weren't officially there. We were just there, you know. And so they respected me and and i walked towards uh, church street and they had police barriers there and and i uh sergeant thomas had said he's the marine that i asked to come with me he goes uh we can't go down here that's our they said the millennial millennial hotel is next it's it's in an imminent danger of collapsing next and i said look sergeant thomas i used to work in a steel mill I know about structural steel beams. That's what I made in my steel mill. Let me make that determination. So we walked down there, and he said, you see how it's bent? And, you know, it's a glass, a black glass building, but the whole bottom half was caked with gray soot from the collapse of the trade centers. So it did look like it was leaning pretty badly, but knowing steel, I, I know that the base, the, those lower beams are, are jumbo beams, what we call them. They're very, very, very thick. There's no way that they would be compromised, the, the structural integrity. So I, I said, hey, I used to make steel beams. That, that building is fine. It's just an illusion. So we were actually standing on the steps of the Millennial Hotel, looking at where the Trade Center complex was. And uh, the doors of the Millennial Hotel were wide open. It, the, everything was abandoned down there. And as we're looking, we see this wall of thick smoke. And, and then all of a sudden, like, it, uh, it just opens up like a circle and gets get bigger and bigger. <clears throat> this is weird because smoke doesn't do that. And I'm, I said, wow. I said, we're looking at the World Financial Center. I, I shouldn't be seeing that. And behind it, the World Financial Center where I worked was silhouetted with a bright orange sun that was going down. It was, it was right then and there. It was dusk. And it was just illuminating the financial center. And you could see the entire debris field. It was like were gone <clears throat> and then it just like that as quickly it, it closed back up and I said Sergeant Thomas I said I said Marine I'm going in here and I want you to go in with me he just said aye aye staff sergeant I said when we cross this road we're going to double time and if anybody yells for us to stop we're charging in aye aye staff sergeant so we did 
we, we double timed across the road and you could hear some, I don't know if FDNY or some cops down the other end of church investigated, oh! We just like ignored them and went in. Nobody came after us. They probably said, hey, God bless those two crazy guys. Like, they're gonna die, you know? <clears throat> Once we broke through that wall of smoke, we saw the whole 16 and a half acres and no one was in there. And it was total devastation. And it hit me that, wow. I said, I said, Tarn Thomas, do you realize that there's billions of eyes fixed on this patch of real estate throughout the world right now? And it's just you and I in here. Think about that. And I said, let's pray. So we prayed. And I said, God, look, you know, we're here. Protect us and guide us to anyone. If anyone survived this, lead us to them. And uh, we started just proceeding. I, I mapped out a hasty patrol route in my mind where we wanted to go. And uh, we started off. The buildings that flanked the left and the right, to our left and the right, were in, on, on fire with such heat that it was bright orange, the heat. That's how the intensity was. We were walking into an inferno. <coughs> It reminded me in the steel mill when uh, they used to have these soaking pits when the, the, the bars, the, the ingots would come down the rolling mill and then they'd change, turn into bars and then you'd have to take them off the rollers because they were getting cold off and put them into these soaking pits. And the charging cranes that when the gates, the doors would open up to the soaking pits, they were so hot in there that it was that same bright orange. <clears throat> and so I knew how hot it was. And we're like, wow, this is, this is crazy. And I knew that area well, because for five and a half years, I worked at the World Financial Center. That was my front yard. And we're walking along and started yelling out, uh, United States Marines, if you can hear us, yell or tap on the steel. Then we'd listen. And we'd go a little further and yell it out again. And you could hear the crackling and stuff collapsing around us. And I told Sergeant Thomas, I said, Sergeant Thomas, I used to work in a steel mill. Watch yourself on these beams. You know, some of these beans are going to be so hot, they'll melt the soles right off your combat boots. And, you know, if you slip off of these things, if they're not stable, you go into that void, you'll get cut up on the jagged steel. And, you know, this is very dangerous, you know. And uh, as we're walking along, I, I'll never forget the, the cocktail of smells that was in the air and that smoke. I mean, I, you could, uh, in my mind, I could make out what each smell was. You know, I, I could smell... Uh, the plastic from the telephones on someone's desk and uh, you know the the plaster that was in the walls and the in the ceilings and 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 I could smell the leather of somebody's shoes burning and their belts and and I could smell hair and flesh and then I'm walking along and I'm seeing little raggedy Ann dolls and little some high red high-heeled shoes and and I'm thinking like wow you know this is these are people I'm smelling, their, their, their body's burning. <clears throat> and I'll never forget that. And, and uh, so we're going along and yelling out and we get to where the, the, we're closer to the towers. And I saw the North Tower had like uh, maybe nine floors that were still standing on the bottom and this jagged stair, stairwell sticking up from it. Maybe it's more than nine floors. It was a 110-story building. It might have been 30. Who knows? But it looked like a high mountain <laughs> of steel. And I said to Sergeant Thomas, I said, you know, that's a, that stairwell, everybody was going down that stairwell. There might still be some people trapped alive on there. If we don't find anybody in our patrol route through here, I'm, I'm going to climb that. Now, I had my repelling ropes with me. <clears throat> and I had been through repelling school at Bridgeport, California, so I knew what I was doing with it. Yeah, you're crazy, Steph, sorry, and you'll never make it up there. It kind of looked like it'd be like tackling Mount Everest, really, except more dangerous. Uh, you wouldn't have to worry about freezing. You'd be, have to worry about burning alive or, or getting sliced up. But it, we, we went a little bit further, and we got to where the fountain was. Remember that brass sphere that was the centerpiece of the fountain in that, uh, that area? It's there, right where the fountain should be. <clears throat> And I, it occurred to me, like, what, how did that happen? <clears throat> how does a metal sphere end up on top of the steel of not one 110-story towers, but two, 
it's not a beach ball, but somehow it bounced up and then it, the beams landed underneath it, then it went back down and then it bounced up again and, and, and the beams went under it again. <clears throat> but I was a Marine and I was with a, a six, in a 16 and a half acre debris field of tangled steel <clears throat> and I made a mental note to use that as a reference point when we found survivors I would guide them to where the fountain was you'll see the sphere sitting on top of the steel shortly after that we're walking and it was dark by then and I just had a a, a 90 degree flashlight stuck in my H harness which was old school you know 2D cell and incandescent light bulb it wasn't very bright right <clears throat> but that's what we used and I had a, a boot band holding it to my H harness and Sergeant Thomas didn't even have that he had one of those keychain lights which was state of the art back in that day <clears throat> and and he said hey Stephen, we gotta get out of here we're gonna get in trouble uh, nobody we're not supposed to be in here and and uh, I said well no I said this don't worry about it it's all right it's getting dark I said I I got my 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 telephone and I got my flashlight we'll be all right plus you could kind of see from the glows of the fires anyway so we're going a little bit further and as we're approaching the south tower <clears throat> Sergeant Thomas had just got done yelling and it hit me powerfully like like God's getting my attention like they're just ahead Dave and I didn't hear anything Sergeant Thomas didn't hear anything but I yelled out and I said uh, United States Marines we can hear you yell louder I hadn't heard them but I was just trying to, if they were there I was going to give them encouragement and we started, we heard like, ah, like muffled cries coming from the, used to, there was the perimeter of the South Tower. We walked over there and I says, uh, he says, we're here, you know, keep yelling, we're coming towards you. We get over there and it was weird because the, the footprint of the South Tower was a big crater and it, it formed, the, the steel formed like a rim around it. And they were, <coughs> they were in that, that rim and I guess about 20 feet down it ended up twisting down there and when I went over there and looked my stuck my head down there the heat was coming up like that that voids on fire <coughs> and it's dark and you know you could see the fires crackling in there and I said who do we got down there and uh, Will Jimeno, Sergeant John McLaughlin, PAPD, PAPD and we're like whoa 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 slow down and I broke out my little Marine Corps tablet that I had in my, my pocket, my Marine field pen, and I started asking them for information. You know, what are your names? Uh, Will Jimeno was uh, Colombian. I, he had a little bit of accent. I couldn't understand him. He's like so like hyper. He's like yelling fast and talking fast. I said, whoa, whoa, <clears throat> how, do you, how do you spell Jimeno? And he's like getting frustrated. Oh, man. <laughs> like, really, it's important. You know, I need to know how to spell your name. And I asked them how many kids they had, their wives' names. I'm getting that information because I, I was planning on calling, the, calling it in. And I, you know, I figured there's probably a lot of prank calls that day. And I wanted them to believe me with details that nobody else would know. Which, how did I know that? I used to be a cop. <clears throat> so, and then uh, I remember Sergeant Thomas, okay, we found him. Let's get out of here, Staff Sergeant. I'm like, no, we're not going anywhere, Devil Dog. You know, we got to stay here because we'll never find these guys again. And uh, how about climbing up on that pal there? And, and if you see, I'm going to call in for, for help. And if you see them, guide them towards us. So he did that. And uh, I, I got out my phone and I called uh, my wife, Rosemary. She was in Queens uh, at her aunt's house. Uh, they were, her aunt was old and afraid. And, and I said, hon, uh, I know you don't, told me not to come down here. <clears throat> but you know, she knows I'm stubborn. I said, uh, I'm in the World Financial Center and I found two trapped police officers and uh, I need to, you to call. I said, when you, I told her what I needed. I, I need like uh, oxygen tanks for them. I need extrication equipment. I need, I need the IVs and stuff like that. And I said, I want you to call the NYPD Command Operations Center and tell them that I'm at the World Trade Center and tell them to just you know, bank <clears throat> south 20 yards from the, the sphere where the fountain was, and you'll find two Marines waiting there. And, uh, and I hung up with her. 
it was weird because the phone wasn't working all day. I mean, everybody that lived here, the communication lines were jammed up. Nobody could get through. And I knew that. And I shot out a prayer to God before I, I even dialed her number. I said, God, you know, let this go through. <clears throat> I had Sprint back then. And uh, I hung out with her. And I called my sister. And boom, it, it, it rang. And she answered the phone. Both calls right away went through. And I told my sister the same thing. You know, call to NYPD Command Operations Center. So both of them, because <clears throat> I didn't know if my battery was going to go dead. I wanted them to work the phones. I didn't have time to be chatting. On, you know, if they didn't believe me, to try to convince them. And, and so then I, I went back to reassuring the cops. And, and lo and behold, you know, about 20 minutes later, uh, one guy shows up. He, Chuck Sereka, used to be a paramedic. And I guess he was a drunkard, and he got fired, and he was off the job for a year. He woke up with a hangover that morning, and he record, listened to his voice message, and it was his sister saying, oh, Chuck, I know, I know you're down there, and, you know, be safe, uh, and God bless you, brother, for what you're doing. And he's like, what is she talking about? And he turns on the television and sees the Trade Center on fire and kind of felt ashamed, like, you know, my sister thinks I'm this big hero down there, and, and here I am sleeping off a hangover. So he puts on his, his old paramedic uniform out of that guilt. He goes down there, and he was standing on the outside the, where all the fire trucks and police cars were stationed, and it, he heard some crackling coming over the radio. The two Marines may have found two Port of Third police officers near 20 yards south from the, the sphere of the fountain. <clears throat> he walks in there all by himself. He had entered with a, a fireman, and after they got a few yards in, the, the FDNY fireman said, he goes, he goes, uh, I got a wife and three kids. We're going to die if we go any further in here. And he left. Chuck Sarekka went on by himself, which I give him a lot of credit for that. That's very brave to go on by yourself uh, after a fireman refused to, to go with you. And he shows up and he goes, what do you got? And I says, we got two police officers down this hole. Boom, Chuck was down the hole and I was right with him. And uh, it took us a long while to find, to get to, because it was like 20 feet down, about 10 feet tangling around. And I had to take off my my war belt because my canteens and k-bar were hanging up on stuff and and we wormed our way through there and <clears throat> and then uh it took us a while to find Wilhelmino because he was right in front of us it was so kind of dark and he was covered with dust and uh, we're like wiggle your finger and i only got that that flashlight that's not very bright and we finally found him even though he's right next to us the whole time and uh he he i gave him some water he actually drank both of my canteens like, I couldn't even do that if I was famished. I mean, he drank both of them. And I felt bad because the sergeant was nearby, and he didn't get a drop. <clears throat> but uh, so then uh, we're digging, helping, and, and we're getting nowhere because we got no tools. And, and Chuck's record, nobody knows he's in there. He went by himself. So uh, I said, uh, I said, God, <clears throat> I said, you got to send somebody with a radio uh, so we can get some help here. And just a maybe five, six minutes later, uh, two NYPD FSU cops uh, uh, show up, ESU. And they're highly skilled in extricating people from uh, building collapses. And, and uh, it was Patty McGee and uh, Scotty Strauss. And they have a radio with them to talk to the NYPD. So that that kicked off the rescue right there. They built it out. But they had no equipment to help. They had been standing out there and they heard the radio traffic come over. The two Marines were possibly in there. And they didn't know if it was legit because a lot of prank calls were being called in, believe it or not. And uh, so we're digging and, and uh, you know, no tools. It's taken forever. We've never done it. And uh, and a fire was encroaching at the feet of Wilhelmino. <clears throat> Mind you, they had been trapped there for 10 and a half hours by the time I rolled up on them. And how they survived it is a miracle because they were, there was a five man team and they were standing like at the eleva freight elevator of the South Tower waiting to go up with a bunch of Scott air packs in it and stuff. And uh, the tower collapsed. Literally like, it's like me and the flowers away and 110 stories lost up in the clouds and how do you survive that <clears throat> well two of them didn't two of them died uh, chris amoroso and antonio rodriguez didn't make it uh, 
because Sergeant McLaughlin said sound off and they didn't sound off. Dominic Pizzula, after a few minutes, was able to free himself and he was going to go get help and John McLaughlin yelled out, no, you're not going anywhere, you free will and then you guys free me. So he's trying to free will and then the, 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 the North Tower collapsed. That's like maybe, what, 15 yards away? And here they are, they're already in a precarious situation where they're being crushed by the steel of the South Tower. They were in that underground concourse when the North Tower collapsed. So they had, they had that, out, that outside fountain area come down on top of them. Like, how do you survive that, let alone the 110 stories beside you? And then the North Tower comes down, and a chunk of the North Tower came in and, and, and hit Dominic Pizzola, and he was dying. And there was an exchange between him and Will, and uh, Dominic said, Will, <clears throat> I love you, man. Don't. Don't ever forget that I died trying to help you. He knew he was dying. And uh, Will Jimeno said, I, I love you too, Dominic. Don't worry, I'll never forget. And uh, last thing Dominic did was he fired off the rounds in his gun trying to draw attention, which was kind of fruitless. Nothing was going to happen with that. And uh, so then the two guys laid there trapped for 10 and a half hours. But that's the that was a miracle just to survive the two collapses of those towers. So here I am. I find them. And now, like, they've got this fire encroaching at the feet of Will Jimeno, and the cops want to board. We've got to get out of here. We're all going to burn alive. Everybody wants to leave. And we're like, no, 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 because I knew that this was all God-led. God had it under control from start to finish. I shot out a prayer to God. I said, God, I know you're not going to let it end like this. Please send somebody here to put out the fire. I no sooner got done with that prayer. <clears throat> This guy jumps in a whole Tommy Asher FDNY with a big old metal clunky fire extinguisher. He opens up the fire extinguisher, shh, puts out the fire. It's just what we needed. He said he was on the perimeter, standing next to his fire truck, and he, he don't know what, this something came over him. Like, he, he looked and he saw the fire extinguisher, and without even thinking, he grabbed it and ran into the pile. Like, why, you think about it, why would he do that? Like, you're a professional FDNY fireman all day long, no one would dare venture in there. And why would you walk in there with a, a fire extinguisher when you've got a 16 and a half acre blaze going? Like, what is that going to do? But it was exactly what we needed. <laughs> and he jumped in the hole and he put out the fire and he called out to the fire trucks for fire hoses and all kind of equipment. And uh, it kicked off the rescue. And we had jaws of life there. We had sawzalls, all kind of stuff. <clears throat> Tommy Asher had the fire hose. Uh, I mean, he requested everything but the kitchen sink, and it was it kept coming. I, I, I kept crawling out to to walk it into the hole where, where they were each time a new piece of gear came, and I uh, almost passed out twice. I mean, when I was seeing stars, literally, and I said, I'm passing out because, you know, I had been through Desert Storm. I had sucked a lot of oil well smoke for months, and my lungs were damaged, and here I am, uh, um, you know, I had been breathing, it took us 50 minutes to find these cops, and now I'm in this hole. It took us three hours to get the cop out, <clears throat> and I'm breathing all this smoke and asbestos, and I started seeing stars, and I know that you don't have much time when you start to see stars, and, and Scotty Strauss said, grab that, that, Scott, that mask next to you is a, a Scott pack, just put it to your face and hit the button. And as, as I'm going out, I, I did it, and I hit the button, and it, like, I, I got blasted with fresh air, and I'll tell you, I would have given a million dollars my whole life savings to, to have that last of fresh air because it, it, was, it was beautiful. You never realize what air, how precious it is until you don't have it. And uh, that was okay then. But then later on I had to, I had to get it, hit it again. But, uh, you know, at one point uh, <clears throat> to free Will Jimeno, we weren't getting anywhere, and Scotty Strauss said that he had to cut this one bar to get him out, and if he did, the, the whole thing on top of us was going to come down. And I said, look, uh, knowing that God had, was in control of all that, I said, look, if it comes down, that we're, we're all going to go together. You know, we're, we're not going to just le walk away and leave these guys. I said, cut it, uh, cut it. And so he cut it, and guess what? It, it didn't come down. But we got Will Jimeno out, and uh, I went up to help lift him out. He was a big boy, heavy, and had him on a, a hard gurney. And I walked out of the pile with him. It took us a, 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 a lot of twisted and contortions. We imagine a, a, a rigid gurney trying to get a, a guy that's like 250 pounds or, or more uh, out of that hole. <clears throat> and uh, when I got up to the top, I had saw like how all that gear was getting to us for that three hours. There was a human chain of hundreds of 
of people. All the firemen and cops that were down there standing outside that wouldn't dare go in. Now, because they knew there were two lives, two people surviving in there, they were willing to risk their lives, and they had formed a human chain up and down that, that tangled steel all the way to Liberty Street. And they were passing that, all that gear into us. And I walked along beside them uh, with uh, Will Jimeno's uh, gurney and got him off the pile. And, and uh, it's a good thing I followed him because, for one, I, I couldn't have spent any more time. The, uh, I told a fresh team to come in and rescue Sergeant McLaughlin because we were, we were done. We were spent three hours of sucking smoke. <clears throat> and uh, so that's what happened. They, another team came in, and uh, they eventually freed uh, the sergeant, John McLaughlin. It took them seven hours to get him out. You know, we got Will Jimeno out a little bit after 11. I think it was actually eight hours. They got him out around 7 o'clock in the morning. So, uh, and he was literally the last man out alive. I found out later that that intact stairwell that I was going to climb with my repelling gear they had the next morning the FDNY right before they got Sergeant McLaughlin out of the hole they had climbed up there and and found a woman that was uh in such shock she was sitting there surrounded by dead bodies she she was she couldn't move uh but she's alive today <clears throat> there's only five people survived the epicenter of the World Trade Center collapse and three of them are alive today the two police officers that I rescued and uh that woman that was on that intact stairwell it was such extreme devastation. How could anybody survive it? Everybody that survived, it's a, it's a miracle. But I, I, I followed Will Jimeno off, and uh, I, got, I got him on an ambulance and expedited him up to Bellevue Hospital. I went with him and, and stayed with him until I, I thought he was, you know, stabilized. And then I went to sleep for a few hours. And uh, I met, when I got there, I met Master Gunnery Sergeant James Carr, who was at 6 Com Battalion, my old unit, I knew him. And he was in charge of the, the command operations center they had set up at Bellevue to handle that crisis. And he said, hey, Sergeant Carnes, or Sergeant Carnes, you're, you're the Marine that did that? I'm like, yeah, I guess so. He goes, well, uh, I'm gonna, you stay here tonight. I, I've made arrangements for you. He told me to go up to, I think the 23rd floor or something. So I go up there and I'm all, I'm, all, I'm all filthy and sweaty, you know, exhausted, and my lungs are hurting, I'm itching. <clears throat> and uh, they, I go through, to, I remember I had to ring a bell and they opened the doors, doctors came out, escorted me into a room, and the nurse came in with a uh, robe, you know, to put on, and she took my clothes, and and uh, she was gonna wash them and stuff for me, which I'm mean, like, no, no, that's okay, you don't have to do that. And I'm glad she did, because they were full of asbestos and fiberglass. And I, I was laying there for, like a couple hours and I couldn't sleep you know like I'm itching my lungs were itching inside I could actually feel like itchiness in my body you know <clears throat> and I got this severe headache and you know my mind's racing a thousand miles why did I leave why didn't I stay to get the sergeant out and blah 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 and <clears throat> I couldn't sleep so I get up and I walk out in the hallway and there's a lady sitting at a desk in the hallway and she starts yelling at me get back in your room I remember like what what is what is this you know, doesn't she know who I am? <laughs> 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 and I said, lady, I got a headache. I need something to put. Get back in your room right now. And I'm like, wow. I said, lady, I, I, gotta, I need something to help me sleep. I got this raging headache. And the doctors heard it, and they come down the hall. And, and I says, doc, why is she yelling at me? And she says, you don't know where you're at. He says, I'm at Bellevue Hospital. He says, no, you're on a psych ward. A psych ward. Master Gun's car. He put me, he did that on, that's how Marines are, even in the middle of a crisis, they, they still joke around. He put me on the psych floor and didn't even tell me. <clears throat> so he, he gave me, uh, I don't know, Benadryls or something, and I said, look, Benadryls, I said, I, I need something like to really put me out. He goes, no, these are very strong, they'll put you out. So I took them, and they did, they put me out after a while. And I woke up, and it was my uniform, all folded, pottery, fresh, and I walked on, I only slept like maybe four hours, and I, you know, I went in and I, they had my breakfast ready, everybody was greeting me, and I'm eating in this glass room that was you know, all these crazy, crazy people sitting around me. <laughs> and they told me, like, you can come back here every day that you're down in New York, uh, Stas and Carnes. We'd be happy to have you. So for three days, I did. I took them up on it. Uh, I spent two more nights there, and each night I visited the two cops that I had rescued. 
And uh, one of the times I was there, one of the guys, the five guys had uh, flatlined and died while I was in visiting the two cops. He was like two beds over. And, uh, you know, the sheriffs would drive me down in the morning, escort me down to the POW. And then I'd, you know, it, I'd come back and visit the cops. But after three days, I, I just stayed on the POW and I lived there for the next uh, five days. I spent eight days in total on the POW. And, uh, you know, breathing all that smoke and I guess it wasn't good for me. Uh, you know, I'm not signed up on anybody's, I'm not on anybody's radar as even being down there. I never put myself on a 9-11 list. To <clears throat> people say, well, what about, you know, 9-11, don't you have a cough? I did have kind of a cough for a year and sometimes it, it, even now it's, you know, I can feel it like my throat's drying up. But God had me to do that and I just trust God for my health. And, you know, people would ask me afterwards, like, Dave, how did you do that? You know, what, you're, you're cra- you got to be crazy to do something what you did. I said, no, no, that's not crazy. I said, uh, it was a win-win situation for me. How's that? I said, because uh, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior uh, right before 9-11 happened. And uh, I have the blessed assurance of my salvation. I went to God in prayer, and I asked God to use me on 9-11. And he used me. He guided me to those two cops. That wasn't me. That was God all through the whole day. It was miracle after miracle. My whole life leading up to that, I mean, he, 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 he made me become a steel worker. I used that knowledge of steel work to, to go down to the World Trade Center to, to trust that the Millennium Hotel wasn't going to collapse. God made me a, a police officer after I got laid off from U.S. Steel. I knew that the, the police, NYPD, and the Port Authority they'd be erring on the side of safety, not having probably lost a bunch of guys and not wanting to lose any more. And their, their communications was probably down. If it was up, they were walking all over each other. It was chaos. And I knew that uh, from being a, a Marine, I went down there as a Marine. That's how I got there, dressed as a Marine. Otherwise, I probably would not, not got near the place because everybody said, oh, thank God the Marines are here. And, and I used my knowledge doing that hasty patrol route through there and having my repelling gear and God made me an accountant a steel worker cop how did I become an accountant but that put me at the World Financial Center my front yard was the World Trade Center I knew that whole area like the back of my hand and God sent me to Wilton Connecticut two weeks before the attack actually two I think it was two months two months before the attack but a short time before. And I was, a, I was hesitant. I didn't want to go to Wilton. I prayed about that. And God gave me peace, and I, I went there. But had God not sent me to my firm's national office, I wouldn't be standing here today talking to you. Because I know as a Marine and a cop, I, I know where I would have been. I would have been in the buildings trying to help people get out, and, and I, I, they would have came down on me. But by God's grace, he had other plans for my life. And he preserved my life. And he used me to rescue those two cops. And today I, I still I stand in awe of God's mercy and that he would choose me. And it was a, a result of, uh, of prayer. God answered my prayer. I asked God that morning to use me if it meant my life. And I guess God knew that I meant business. <clears throat> Maybe for the first time in my life I prayed to God and I actually meant business. Uh, you know, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is 1 John 5.13. God says in his word, these things I have written unto you <clears throat> that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And you may believe in the name of the Son of God. And God gives us assurance. That we have confidence that, uh, <clears throat> that we can trust in God. And, it, and in the petitions we put to God, he hears us. And he heard me that day. And he guided me, and he protected me, and he gave me this testimony. And right now we're working on a, they're working on a project to, to get to use this this testimony to to win lost souls for Christ. I got saved shortly before 9/11. I, I remember I was sitting right back there, having come out of Roman Catholicism. Uh, I was on a, a year before I, I found Bible Baptist. I was, every weekend, I had read the Bible through from cover to cover like four times. And I was going around each weekend visiting different churches like Methodist, Lutheran, Assembly of God. And, you know, I saw some crazy stuff in some of those churches. 
And I was trying, I knew it, it, the, the Bible said to test all things by the word of God, including the church that you're going to attend. And, you know, if I, if I walked into a church and there was a woman at the pulpit preaching, I didn't even bother. I just turned around and walked out. Let me try again next week. <clears throat> I wanted to find a Bible-centered church. And I had driven by here several times. I haven't lived down um, off of Marlowe Road, Central Avenue and Valley Stream. I, I saw, you know, a white tent here. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was like uh, some kind of a flea market or something or a circus. I don't know. <clears throat> and even in winter, I saw you guys, like, God bless you, out there in this tent. Like, and then uh, I guess when you moved inside, you, there was a sign put up out front, Bible Baptist Church. And I'm thinking, wow, Bible Baptist Church. I'm looking for a Bible-centered church. This Sunday, I'm going to come here. <clears throat> and I came in, and there was, like, no carpeting. The, the wires, the ceiling was exposed. Wires hanging everywhere and sparks flying, I think. And <laughs> Pastor Barker's up here. And, uh, you know, no, I'm used to Roman Catholicism with stained glass windows, golden chalices, and, you know, the focus on the appearances of the building and fancy robes. And Pastor Barker's wearing a suit and tie like me. And I heard good solid Bible preaching for the first time in my life in Bible Baptist Church in Elmont and but I tell you what it, even though with Pastor Barker's rock solid non-compromising preaching the word of God I it took me a year coming here before I got saved because I remember he preached something that pierced my heart because I thought that I wasn't worthy of salvation and knowing what I had done and the sins I had committed in my life. And, and uh, I, I was thinking in my mind, someday I'm going to make myself worthy and do enough good deeds that God will save me. But Pastor Barker convicted me that that was a sin to do that and that you've got to come broken before the throne of God and that nobody is worthy, can be worthy of salvation. And the light bulb went off. And I... I shook off those shackles of Roman Catholicism, and I, I asked God to save me. And to this day, I have that blessed assurance of my salvation. That, and that's, what, that's how I was able to do what I did on 9-11. Because God led me down there, and I was on a mission from God, and if I died absent from the body, present with the Lord, it was, and if I, if I lived and I, I did what God told me to do and it ended up I, you know, two cops are alive today because of it. Uh, but I owe it all to God and I just, uh, I stand in awe, like I said, to this day, I stand in awe that God had used somebody as unworthy as me <clears throat> to, to do what he had me to do. God wants everyone to be saved, everyone. And I think now, today, especially, all Christians need to have a, a rock-solid urgency to get the gospel out because I, these are really wicked times that we're living in. And there's a lot of, a lot of people, just on 9-11, you know, some people think that all those people went straight to heaven because of that circumstance. No, there's a lot of people in hell today that were in those buildings because they never trusted in Jesus Christ. So we need to we need to be diligent and get the word out. But I'm I'm honored to be back in Bible Baptist Church. I love this church. I love everybody here. I wish I could just go around to all of you, give you a big hug. And thank you. Thank you so much, Lord, for this wonderful testimony of not only bravery and patriotism and dedication, but, Lord, this testimony of your power, of your grace at work when we just make ourselves willing vessels. Lord, we pray that you would help us to embrace that spirit of willingness, willing to do whatever you ask of us, Lord, because you're worthy. Well, we pray you give us assurance of salvation tonight. Thank you for Brother Dave's testimony of how he knew to be absent with the body, to be present with the Lord, that he knew Christ as his Savior. He knew he was on his way to heaven. Lord, would you give us all that tonight? Help us to know the hope, the assurance that only comes from Jesus Christ. As our heads bowed and our eyes are closed tonight, no one's looking around. Maybe there's some sinner tonight that you've been wrestling with this, and God's spoken to you. You say, Pastor, I need to make sure that I'm saved. God's speaking to me. 
the Holy Spirit's convicted me. I want to make sure that I am saved. That's my need. Would you slip your hand up? We want to pray for you tonight. So that's my need. I want to make sure that I'm saved, that I have this settled. Lord, thank you for just the preaching of your word and declaration of your testimony. Would you just continue to work in our hearts, stir us up as your people. And again, we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to collect an offering here in just a moment. And it's our custom whenever we have a guest speaker to collect an offering. And so let's be a blessing to Brother Dave and the ministry that this week as they record and set and prepare this uh, presentation for uh, first responders and others for the gospel. And so let's do our part to be a blessing for that. And let's pray for tonight's offering. I'm going to ask Brother Rob, would you please stand and lead us in a prayer, please? Let's all stand together. We're going to close with a chorus tonight, and I hope you stick around and get a chance to fellowship with some of our guests and see Brother Dave as well. But we're going to sing 430, page 430, if you need it in your hymnal, The Windows of Heaven Are Open. Page 430, if you need it. The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart Since Jesus made everything right I gave him my old tattered garment He gave me a robe of pure white I'm feasting on manna from heaven And that's why I'm happy tonight I'm going to ask Pastor Scudder, would you please close us with a word of prayer, please? Oh, Father,